What is going on, everybody? Today's video, pretty much what the title said, why I'm setting up less at card shows this year than in previous years. I would have to say the number one reason. Now, this is for, let me have a full disclaimer out here, for guys who set up in certain regions that don't go outside, say, 100 to 150 miles, I'd probably say from their own location. So for like me, that would cover Louisville. Um, I don't want to throw Nashville in because they bring people in from all over, but Lexington, Salem, Newburgh, um, shows up through Indianapolis minus the big one, the monster. So like your Fisher show, the, I forget what they call it. The one hotel show, all those combined into there is that you see the same cards at every single show that I travel to. Now, occasionally you'll get a few different dealers in there. Don't get me wrong, but they're not overturning product to have newer selections every time you come in. And that there is a very, very hard task, regardless of whoever you are out there. Unless you're constantly buying collections, that's the only thing you're doing, and you're setting up at these shows in the weekend, coming back and hurrying up, going through collections and replacing stuff. Uh, the most average seller out there, when I use average, I'm not talking like, you know, middle class, like um, money-wise and stuff. They don't have the resources to go out there and keep doing that. And if they buy from eBay, everybody's like, oh, well, that just sold for this. It's the same exact card. No, and it could, they could have got a steal of a deal or whatever out there. But it's mostly because for myself, I have to change out my cards a good frequent bit. And even if I only change out 10, it just doesn't feel right to me for one. Um, I don't have really fresh, that fresh of inventory. I could do it, but, you know, after I did two or three shows, I sit there, I would start recycling the same cards. Of course, you're going to have a different audience of buyers and stuff, but no joke, like where I'm at, a lot of people travel to all those shows. That's what they want to do. And I've noticed plenty of times, and guys even ask me anything new, and I'm like, hey, just this stuff here, so-and-so. Now, for me, if I only set up three to four times a year, probably four, no more than five, I could say that, you know, I'm going to have different cards at each show, regardless. A lot of different ones. I mean, I'd probably say 50 to 70% of my cards would be different at each show. Because of moving stuff on eBay, Com C, um, Zooms that we do, and stuff like that there, I'd have a more refresher inventory going around in the shows. For me, whenever I would see, you know, we had two Louisville shows. You had the Salem show, the Lexington show. Um, a lot of those guys traveled at Newburgh. There was another one with Ethan's card shop, something, Elvis covers, and whatever else he calls himself, and more he had a show. But you saw a lot of the same dealers, same inventory, same wax boxes, same everything. And, you know, you get guys that come up, and they're like, hey, anything new? Boom, gone. You say no, they're gone. So people are looking for fresh stuff they don't see all the time. And for me, that's a big stress and headache. Like, hey, I got to hurry up, sell this stuff here. Let's hurry up, throw it to D.C. or eBay auctions, get money, hopefully get what I want for it. Then try to go find other cards, you know, go and look in Facebook, Instagram, all these places for it. It, it. it really turns into a headache. I mean, I'm not joking around on that. It, it's painful. Because a lot of times you may not succeed because people aren't willing to part with stuff. And I'm one of them guys who like to find the rare cards. I don't want to go to a show and just overturn all my prison base is now select base or whatever, you know. And that's the hard part there. That's the number one reason. The number two reason is this. And it's probably because of my mentality from the 90s, early 2000s, even through like 2017, 18, I would say. Well, actually, a little bit later, till COVID. We'll say till COVID. When you went to a show, guys weren't coming up to you asking you what would you take for this card or want to buy off of a dealer who is paid at the show and wanting to buy it 60, 70, 80% comps. That's what the dealers are buying at because they have to refurbish themselves and they're paying for the table, taking their time out. 
And that's why I've been saying in other videos, hey, dealers need to start taking it back. It's one thing that whenever you have people that you do a lot of deals with and you're doing, oh, yeah, I'll do these at 80, these at 90, this I can't move on. You know, that's something totally different from where I'm coming at. I mean, honestly, I get whether they're young, middle-aged, in their 40s, 50s, what's the lowest you'll take on this? What will you really take for this card? You know, to me, it's very disrespectful onto it. Just throw out, hey, will you take this onto it? Even if it's a low ball, I at least respect it more than you try and turn the ball into my court. I mean, I don't go to a car dealership and go, what will you really take for this car? I mean, think about it here. <laughs> this is where we've come and really ruined the hobby the most onto it by watching these YouTube videos of guys doing it all the time. And it's expected now that everybody has to go out there and do it. One of the biggest scams, I think, is the trade-up challenge at these shows. It was cool at first, but, you know, but now it's just that uh, you still got people wanting to do it. I'm going to trade-up challenge now. Go away. And to me, it's one of the biggest scams out there. Some kid starts with a dollar and he tries to work up to a $500 card by the end of the show. I mean, good for them, good for the hustle and stuff. But to me, nah, I'm done doing that stuff. I did one, last one I did was probably beginning of last year. But that, that was it. No more of that stuff. But getting back to the original focus of it all here, that's just one of those things where... If that's the way it's going to be, I'm just going to go up to other dealers and start doing it the whole way around, offering 70, 80 percent and buying a bulk of their table and see if they'll do it. I mean, what's the point of me setting up? If I could get more money off of eBay, and I think I'm what 11, 11.9 percent fees right now, or 10.9, I have to go back and look. Why would I sell it for 20 percent? And here's the biggest catch is that person coming up to me wants to buy it. And it will just be nice at 80% of the last sale. And their thing is, well, you have to pay for shipping and it's cash. One, I still have to record it. So it shows their business etiquette there and knowledge and, and even ethics onto it. At the same time frame, you're not paying sales tax. I have to cover that. In my state, it could be 6%. I think California is 8%, something like that. It's expensive. And when you have to cover all that if you're doing it by the books. A lot of people don't understand when you explain it. It's just like they get down in the dumps. Well, okay. And they just move on. But that's one of the most common things I see. The other one is, you know, I like repackers. Don't get me wrong. There's a couple of them out there that I deal with frequently. And this has nothing to go out with them. But there'll be other ones that come up to me and be like, oh, yeah, we're buying for a repack. You sell it 70 80%. And they want the good stuff. They want the stuff that's their chasers. No. If you're a repacker coming to my table and you want those cars for a chaser, you should be paying top dollar for it. That's your chaser card. That's your bread and butter. In my opinion, you want to buy some of the other stuff that's like freaking silver prisms and stuff that's plentiful at 80, 85%. I got no problem on that. But you also got to pick up some of the chasers. But that's the other thing I've been noticing a lot of is that you know, a lot of the prices are like that. The one thing that I noticed, I talked about the Midwest Monster, there were a lot of signs up buying at 80% dealers. I think it's fair, to be honest. But that also means that you have to sell it at 90% to make money. Just a way to look at it across the board. I, I do believe the other thing that we're going to start seeing a lot more of coming up this year through 2025 is that the states are going to start coming to these card shows and saying, where's your sales tax license at? You know, got one, they're going to make you fill out the form there. I see that coming. That's going to hurt a lot of these dealers with these deals going on out there. Because just imagine if you're selling a big bulk of your collection, 70%, and then you got to still pay 6% sales tax. Now you're down to 64. That's the other thing. eBay collects it for you. I'm not saying eBay is the king or anything like that. But eBay makes it simple for me. They collect the sales tax. That just goes into my program tax jar. That's an eBay thing. They already covered the sales tax. I don't have to worry about those pieces there. And the same thing with like Com C. They do the same thing for me as well too. So really the only thing I'm down at the end of the day on is uh, cash sales. Even PayPal does it for me. 
unless I have it programmed in there saying in my website too that, you know, hey, I know the student has a sales tax license and stuff like that. But that's the other reason why I'm not really going to be setting up at a lot of shows this year. It's just due to the fact that if I want to get lowball offers, I'll just put it on eBay and it's less stress. Shows are supposed to be meant to be fun. They always were meeting places and stuff like that. It's really changed. And I thought it would start getting better. I really did this year. And it really, really has not. I mean, you still get the same exact people that do that that I've never seen before. They come around every show and it's the same thing. Like I said, this doesn't apply to every single person, especially some of the guys that watch the videos and stuff like that that I do deals with all the time. Not meant towards you guys because we do it back and forth. I sell to you at a certain price, then you do the same thing for me, vice versa. It works out both ends at the end of the day. But a lot of these guys don't set up at the shows, and if they do, they want max value for all their stuff, but they still are only willing to pay X amount for it all. But that, that's another one of my headaches off the bat. So you already got the inventory turnover for one, and then two being, you know, dealers have not taken back the shows and even if i say you know hey let's all band together and do it if i got every dealer in the show to agree to it i guarantee half of them still wouldn't live up to it because at the end of the day they just want that cash flow coming in and out uh and i know a lot of them have to be losing money because i don't know where they're getting their inventory from just me personally when i look at it across the boards i mean a lot of the guys i know buy out collections a lot of them are sitting in storage bins stuff like that there they've done it for years not those guys there, but just the ones that, you know, just do graded cards, have showcases, they don't have value boxes, nothing like that. Makes you wonder, I mean, how much can you keep on affording taking loss all the time onto it? Craziness. And I will say the very, very final reason why I'm doing a lot less shows this year is just that as I get older, getting up early, going to these shows to set up, it, it, it starts getting painful doing it. And, you know, I've talked to a few other people that I know used to set up a lot of shows. They've gradually gone down just to go on a couple shows a year. And they've agreed with me, you know, the time and hassle that you put into setting up at these shows, it doesn't pay for your bang to the buck. If you have an agenda going there, and I'll use the example of the Midwest Monster up in Indianapolis. So yes, I am set up. I have two tables this year. My overall goal is to buy as people are walking around selling their stuff. If I sell, I sell. But I couldn't do that three, four times a month or two to four times a month, I should say, at every single show. The bigger shows I could do that at. The smaller ones, it wouldn't pan out because as people walk around, you know, you have a lot of arguments between what the value of a card is. Or I should say disagreements because it sounds a little bit nicer, I know. Guys like, oh, I'm into it way too much and all this stuff. I need to get this. One of the most common things I've heard. You know, I'm into it too high. You know, hey, if you want the money, this is what I'm paying you for. It. This is what I perceive the value at. You perceive the value at the same price or a little bit higher or lower. But yet you still want, you know, a year ago's price and six months ago's price and stuff onto it. To me, I could just sit there and just... Make offers all day on ComC, My Slabs, eBay. I could hit golden auctions, PWCC auctions, um, Facebook Marketplace. Try to think of the other ones. You got the Goodwill auctions if you're really good at looking at what's in that stuff. Occasionally, if you follow the governmentdeals.com, there's another one there. You could get better deals that way than you do at the shows in the same time frame. If I'm not in a rush to sell the stuff, you know, I can have it posted between various places to move the cards. And they can sit there and I don't have to put up with, you know, people coming up offering crazy low offers, I would say. It shows on to all because they think, oh, it's cash. You're not going to record it. That's the wrong answer. You should be recording it. You should be. <laughs> if you're not, I'm telling you, I just have this weird feeling. It's not nothing that's been said out there, but just from... What I've seen um, transpiring with all this stuff is that I can start seeing some of these shows, some of these states starting to travel these shows saying, asking dealers, where's your sales tax license at? 
you don't have one, they make you sign right up for it. And hopefully, you at least have your EIN there handy, because if not, you have to use your social. But those are mostly the basic reasons on to it, you know. Just having to change the inventory, and I mean, you can't just sit there at these little shows and bring a ton of cards worth 5000 or even $2,000 and up. Odds are you might sell one here or there, one a month onto it. Maybe that's just the way some people are onto it. I just can't see doing it to smaller shows. Now, if you were traveling with the big shows, I could see doing all that. You'd probably get more sold. But just the overall, of, like, cards not changing what people have each time that you walk by, you know... Even in the older days, people changed out inventory a lot. Even in the 90s, you saw a lot of different inventory every time. Even though they were produced a lot, there was only four baseball card uh, manufacturers at that time frame. Don Russ, Fleer, Score. Actually, we'll go five tops and upper deck came in 89. But you would still see different cards at all the tables going across the board. Mostly you'd see different vintage back then. Which you don't see a lot of anymore. A lot of these uh, smaller shows is vintage dealers. And when you do, I, I it's usually older guys. And they're saying, well, the Beckett says this online. And you're like, oh my gosh, no, I can't. <laughs> you know, Beckett might call this card a $1,000 card. But recently, raw and around similar shape, they're selling for like four or 500 I don't even bother with it anymore onto it. But I still will continue going to shows to buy. You guys will get to see stuff like that there. Um, a lot of the videos this year are going to be when I go to shows taking, you know, anywhere from, I'd say 300 to a thousand, just to, I'll, I might still buy some nice cards, but you'll see me digging in value boxes to load up to com C. Cause if you guys see in the previous video, killer on hockey, killer stuff. And, you know, I talked about this before is that a lot of people don't like hockey. It's not like one of the top sports everybody's all out after but if you look like the cup stuff this year <laughs> game worn versus panini patches that are not guaranteed from any specific player or event whatever it says in the back of it makes you wonder on to now i do know that those patches a lot of people will say hey the player worn holds a little bit of a value but collectors are only out for the game worn and stuff like that get rid of all your non-game worn and all that some of it makes sense it just depends on that person and how they collect and are they out there just to flip some pure collectors they will say they only want do you know the player worn or game worn or both and they don't want all that other hoopla out there but We'll have to get into that in another video, I think, offhand. But this was the major reason. I know a lot of people keep asking me about it on to it, like why I'm not setting up a lot. Those are my major uh, things this year. It's just that inventory itself, I want to try to have more fun in a hobby this year. And I know some of you guys are going to be like, oh, man, he's opening up hockey again and stuff like that there. But it's just fun to me. And that's what I want to try to try to do is have more fun with it this year than the stress and the burden of having to change out inventory between shows all the time. At the same time frame, not having to go to shows, setting up, and just being lowballed nonstop on stuff you don't see all the time out there. I can understand, you know, the common prism PSA 10 or silver PSA 10s and the tons of downtowns and kabooms you see at every show. But, I mean, some of the stuff that you don't see a whole lot of, like, old triple threads autos or, you know, like the triple thread, like Montana Rice and Young that I picked up. Stuff like that there. Exquisite basketball, exquisite football. You know, people still want to get that stuff at a low cost onto it because, you know, we're still on that flipping stage out there. And there's nothing wrong with that. People are always going to do it. It's been that way for years. But it's just to a point to where do I waste my time sitting at a table all day doing that? Or do I take my day and go scout all the other tables trying to find, you know, stuff that I can use to either resell or 
you know, one of my top 10 cards of the year to pick up and stuff like that. So hopefully that all makes sense to everybody out there. But I at least wanted to explain more why I was not going to do a whole lot of setting up the card shows this year. And that's mainly the reason behind it. Um, it had nothing to do with, you know, oh, I don't like these promoters to, oh, well, the shows uh, occasionally suck, you know, for two or three months here. Are you just trying to hit the hot months? No, no, really, I'm not. It just falls on to inventory changeover. When you go as a solo person, you got to hope somebody you're left or right can watch your tables for you as you go walk around and try to make, you know, some buys and stuff like that. To constantly, you know, getting guys, you know, with the how much will you really take for this? How low will you go on to it mentality on every card in your showcase on to it? Um, th those were like the really, really big ones of it all. All right, guys. Didn't really want to make it more into like a Debbie Downer type video, but I wanted to explain outright on to it uh, with my reasoning behind it. If I had the time to go to more of the bigger shows where you're talking 100 tables plus at every show filled out 100 to 500, that would be a different story. This was more for like your local shows that are anywhere from, I don't know, 10 to 20 tables minimum to about 50 to 60, maybe 75. But your bigger ones are like 100 tables plus. You know, there's a lot of promoting that's going on to it. That's a totally different ballpark. I think that the factors I showed there wouldn't really fall into my reasoning. But if I could say I would do a show a month ago, these big shows like Cincinnati, Moeller, Chicago, Nashville, um, Dallas somehow, get all my stuff out to there, Burbank and all that stuff. But then you start looking at travel, wear and tear in a vehicle and all that. It, it starts making me, you know, like, uh, I don't know if I still want to do that as I get older. Those drives tend to be a little bit longer and stuff on to me and stuff. But yeah, for those smaller shows, you won't see me setting up it a whole lot. Like I said, no offense to the dealers and stuff, or the dealers, the guys that run the shows and stuff like that. I think more than likely, like I said, you'll see me at about, I would say four, no more than five shows a year set up. And that's usually because there's like a big one or two in there. But locally, probably maybe three a year on to it. Because otherwise, you could always go to a lot of the bigger shows that hold trade nights. And I did this last time. I sold a lot of trade night and just at the show itself without a table. So, just other different ideas that are going through my mind to try in 2024. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes overall. But you will not see like a, <laughs> a six to eight episode where I go to a show every week set up again. Ooh. <laughs> that, that was draining. I'm not going to lie. Those guys that do it, they're, you know... 45 and plus, I give it to you in age bracket. I give it to you. All right, guys, that's it for real this time. I'm out. See you next one.